the goal of economics should be to deliver shared prosperity in a meaningful way to as many people on, on the planet as possible. I grew up in Sheffield in, in the north of England and I, I come from a family uh, that has been in Sheffield for a long time. One side of my family made screws for a hundred years. We had a, a small family uh, factory and that was on my father's side. On, on my mother's side, my grandfather was a metallurgist and, and a executive in, in, who was running one of the largest steel mills in Sheffield. So I grew up with this knowing about this industrial tradition and, and knowing about the, the, the sort of strength of industry in the UK. But of course, I, I, being born in 1963 and, and becoming aware of my surroundings more in the 1970s, these were years of crisis. There were, there were power cuts, there were strikes, there, were, there was a big struggle over economic policy and, 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 and how to shape the country. And um, I went to university in uh, 1981 when Mrs. Thatcher was, I think, at the height of her powers. And there was a lot of questioning of, is this the right way to approach economics? And at that same time, uh, Sheffield uh, fell into you know, a, a very hard period, I would say. And, and my family, businesses, all of those activities ended up um, being more or less destroyed, in part by the macroeconomic approach of, of the country's government. And, and I think an experience like that both taught me the importance of economics, it made me think about economic history, it made me think a lot about policy, and it made me think a lot about alternatives and, and what you can build um, and, and what you can destroy um, if you're not too careful. So I've always thought that economics should be more uh, like engineering. It, it hasn't been like this historically, but I think maybe we're heading in, in, in this direction now. By, by engineering, I mean, how do you build a bridge? How do you prevent a bridge from falling down? How do you um, create infrastructure that, that is safe and, and useful for people? These are the questions that, that economics, I, I think, can and, and, and should uh, confront. Now, they're, they're difficult questions, and, and when you're talking about an entire economy, an entire people, the scale is, is big, and of course, there are different places and different perspectives and different cultures around the world. You have to take that into account. But I think um, I like economics as a practical, approach to solving real world problems. And, and I think, to me, the goal of economics should be to deliver shared prosperity in a meaningful way to as many people on, on the planet as possible. We obviously have a lot of problems in, in the world today. In, in global inequality, the difference between rich and poor countries is, 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 is one of them. The gaps are immense and they're, they're not really closing on, on average. Look, if, if you don't apply scientific approaches, if you don't try to be careful with the data, if you don't test hypotheses, these problems will still exist. Other solutions will come forward. Other people will step up and say, oh, I know how to fix this. We're going to do it this way or that way. Now, perhaps they have some good ideas, but isn't it better? Haven't we learned that it's generally better to approach all our social problems through the lens of, of data and being careful about how we measure things, and trying to understand what are the alternative hypotheses. So economics is not a science in, in the laboratory sense of physics or chemistry or biology, but good economics, I think, ap applies the scientific method in a way that's appropriate to the scale of the problems we're trying to deal with. And I think economics, since, since I started to study economics in the 1980s and since I went to graduate school um, at MIT in the mid-1980s, I think the profession has changed dramatically and, and to my mind has moved in, 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 a, in a really good direction. There are many people who become very good ec economists and excellent researchers, and they're obviously very different kinds of people. I do think that in, in general, it is very good to ask big questions and to seek out data and, and approaches that are meaningful and, and that can really deliver on, if not complete answers, steps towards an answer for, for the big questions confronting society, such as inequality, such as global inequality. Such, such as uh, poverty, uh, and you know, I, I think we should be respectful of the variety of methods, and we should encourage each other and, and be positive, but also to be, be critical and, and be tough and, and be fair in, in, in those assessments. I think that, that's, to me, the, what, what we've learned from science over 300 years and, and what economics is, is now applied. Uh, in the end of the 1990s, I got a job at MIT and I, I had worked at that point for quite a long time in Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union. I had a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard and then a faculty position at Duke University in the Fuqua School of Business. A and getting a job at MIT was, was a big break for me in, in my career because obviously MIT has long been a hub of 
really innovative research, in, including in, in, but not limited to economics. And so I was in, in, engaged in many conversations with people and I was trying to find ways to participate in different research projects. And I was very interested in issues around corruption, the underground economy, things we now call institutions, because from my experience in, in the former communist world, standard economic analysis and macroeconomic policy had not worked out as we expected because these other problems kept coming up and it didn't feel like they, these were one-off or incidental problems, but I didn't have a big picture and didn't have a complete understanding. So I was talking to plenty of people and I got into conversation uh, after one seminar with Ron Asimoglu, talking with him about uh, ways to, to approach it empirically some of the ideas that, that he'd been discussing in, in, in a seminar because I'm, I'm very interested in data and, and empirical methods and trying to make progress that way. And, and Duron started to describe to me some of the thinking that he and Jim had already had with regard to European empires and the history of those empires. And he said, but we need to figure out why exactly the Europeans made the choices they did and wh whether there's a sort of unified historical explanation that we could have some statistical representation of that be meaningful because if we can do that then we can get to much more effective econometrics of understanding institutions historically and also institutions today and how those affect GDP per capita. And, and when he first explained the problem and, and what they were looking for and what I thought about what I could contribute, my first thought was, wow this sounds really really difficult. And my second thought right after that was, absolutely yes let's go. And, and I, I think my, my claim to fame <laughs> in, in this case and, and perhaps more broadly is that I know a good idea when it slaps me in the face. And, and, and when Dron described the problem, I'm like, yes, this is a huge problem. And, and I see how it ties together all these pieces. And, and I can see what I can bring to this partnership that Dron and Jim or, already had. A, and I worked really hard uh, on, on that, both for the initial breakthrough, which became our paper, it's known as Colonial Origins, and, and on the subsequent papers. Um, you know, I was um, getting up at six in the morning before I started, before I met Duran and Jim. Then I was working at five in the morning when the stuff got intense. I was getting up at four in the morning and um, I did that for years and years and years. And I don't regret a moment of it. Some people uh, learn by, by thinking by themselves. Some people learn by, by reading books. Uh, I, I learn by, by doing, by, by doing things, by trying to do things, by, by failing, by encountering problems. And I, I think a lot of my learning is also interactions with people, so the conversations with students, with policymakers, with, with people going about their everyday lives. And I think what happens, as, as I look back, what, it, what, what has happened to me during my career is at various key moments, because I had this um, depth of um, perspectives and connections to people, but not a complete picture, when a complete picture is presented to me. Um, for example, I was at a dinner a couple of years ago where a, a friend of mine uh, who was a senior treasury official in the United States said, you know, what we should really do is approach the Putin's invasion of Russia with regard to economic sanctions in the following way. And I had been working on this problem for quite a few months. I'd been working on it very intensely with a lot of people. And I had not thought of the idea that she put forward at that moment. But as soon as she said it, I, it was immediately clear to me that yes, this was what we should do because I had tried all these other things and I'd thought them through and I'd written about them and they were all not very satisfactory. They were all ran into trouble. This proposal that the Treasury had, that Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, was putting forward made absolutely complete sense to me. And I pivoted and I said, yes, we, we will now do exactly that. I will do that. We should do that. Let me help. I'll join the team. What do we do? I say to... Um, my students and, and, and other young academics, it, it's, I think one of the problems academics sometimes face, this may sound a little strange, because people who are not academics think that academics have, are rather full of themselves. My experience, academics don't take themselves seriously enough, because everything you write, everything you say, you should imagine that it will be heard by a million people and, and read by a hundred thousand and examined carefully by ten thousand and a thousand young smart people will try and make their reputation disproving what, whatever result you put forward. And, and if you approach uh, life and public statements and the writing of research papers through that perspective, then everything you do will be of a much higher quality and you will hold yourself to a much higher standard. And, and you won't be disappointed when people don't notice the work and you won't be upset when people don't find mistakes. But, but when people push back and, and when there is um, a counter narrative that someone strikes to develop, you, you're, you're ready for it. You're expecting it. You're, you're prepared. And I, I, I'm not sure I would say that I've had 
failure so much as, you know, when you do empirical work in particular, sometimes the data don't cooperate, sometimes the results are not robust enough. Um, I remember uh, in, my, in my entire relationship with, with Duran Asimoglu, we've written 20, more than 20 papers in a book, but I always remember, and I sometimes remind him of this, and it really annoys him, that there was one very good idea that I had, and, and I showed him the results, and, and I said, you know, the results are not that robust, I have to tell you. And he's like, yeah, you're right, Simon, we shouldn't write this paper. And, and somebody else wrote the paper independently, and it's quite a famous paper. And, and I remind him from time to time that we should have written that paper. And he says to me, well, yes, Simon, but the results weren't that robust. So, you know, fair point. We move on. I think asking big questions is, is important. When, when I was in graduate school in the 1980s, I think that was a little bit discouraged. I think economics became a little bit narrow. And it is important to ground your work in, in what's already established. And, when a brand new PhD says, I've changed all of economics, everyone has to think about the world differently, here's the result. Yeah, you do take that with a, with, a, with a fair amount of skepticism. But I think asking big questions and trying to make progress, particularly through an empirical angle, show me the data, show me the evidence, show me the robustness on a really big question. I, I, th I think that is a highly productive avenue for many people to pursue. Well, I, I think when, when, you're, when you're a teacher, um, you have a responsibility to, to listen to people and to try to understand them and to try to help them, basically. Now, ob obviously, if you're a researcher, you have your own perspective, you put forward your own positions. Um, but I, I'm always looking to engage. I'm always trying to um, think about other people's perspectives. And, and yes, with, with regard to students of all kinds, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to help them. I think it's a, it's a wonderful experience uh, being a teacher and, and a great responsibility. I, I've always tried to do my best. Oh, I've had many mentors and inspirations, but the, the person who really stands out uh, is my undergraduate tutor uh, at Corpus Christi College in Oxford. Uh, his name was uh, Andrew Glynn. He sadly died quite young, otherwise he would have been here today and, and he would have absolutely enjoyed this week. Um, but he, he was a, a Marxist and, and he taught us uh, neoclassical economics. And he did not try to impose his Marxist views on us, and I'm certainly not a Marxist and never have been. But what I took from those conversations was, first of all, neoclassical economics is, is a useful set of analytical tools, but what you should really understand and care about is the power in society. Who has what power to do what? And where did that power come from, and how does that power shape narratives, policy, the development of technology? And I, and I think, looking back, that those conversations and those interactions with Andrew Glynn have absolutely shaped my career. What I really like to read is history. And, and the reason I like to read history is I'm always interested in the backstory. How did we get here? Why do we think about things like this? What, what, where did this technology come from? And so I like to go back and see what were the decisions, who was involved, what were the, the key moments when some people or the world went in this direction rather, in, rather than in, in that direction. And um, the more I read about history, the more I become fascinated. And the more I read about technology, the more I want to understand the underlying science. So to me, it's never ending and it is absolutely fascinating. But I also like to read science fiction because I think science fiction is history in reverse. Good science fiction is people imagining entire societies that are on different paths with different technologies and different social structures. And um, the, the best science fiction is absolutely just as compelling as the best history. Well, I have, I have a lot of favorite books, but I like to say to people, my, many of my audiences right now, when I talk about the future of technology and, and policies and the choice facing us, the, the question of the future can, can be framed as which Neil Stevenson novel will we live in? So the snow crash, which is fairly dystopian, there's the diamond age, which, which is actually a, a brilliant um, imagining of, of the potential for transforming education uh, with, with AI. And uh, he has a number of other novels that are really entirely uh, thought-provoking. But I also need to call out, I think, to Isaac Asimov's uh, Foundation trilogy, um, which many people have loved. And, and I think the reason for that is he has this idea that once, if we ever get to the point where there are a lot more people and a lot more worlds and a lot more data, that we will be able to model and think about social interactions like we think about physical world interactions and, and, and um, hard sciences today. And, and that is a really intriguing notion that I think uh, that, 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 that a seed from that, I, from that uh, those, those novels definitely planted in my mind when I was quite young. 
Well, I like to play games, uh, board games included in, including the, in the genre of, of war games. And, and so these, these are um, alternative histories and, and strategies, and, and you can see different worlds emerge when you follow different paths. And, and I think um, playing those games, including with other people, including with my kids, uh, has always been a great passion and, and a lot of fun. My best ideas come to me in moments when I meet people whom I respect and I listen to them make a proposal about something I'm quite well informed about and they tell me something that I didn't know. And that those are my light bulb moments. So I think Pasteur famously said something like, chance favors the prepared mind. And my interpretation of that is exactly the preparation of your mind is you've explored, you've tried these different avenues, you haven't cracked a problem, and then somebody presents you with a solution or an idea or a key that unlocks the problem. But the only reason that key is valuable to me is because I've already explored as many aspects of that problem as possible. Uh, I think tennis is, is, is a great exercise and it's a great combination of, of mental processing and physical ac activity. Um, I have a great tennis coach, his name is Charles Chasseur, and, and he always says, you've got to solve the problem. When you're playing against someone, they, they have strengths, they have weaknesses, solve the problem, Simon. W you know, what is it that you need to do? Why did they just win those points and you didn't? And you know, it's on, it, you're, you're, it's on the fly, you're doing it by yourself, you, you don't, you're not generally allowed to have coaching or in real time, <laughs> the level of tennis that I play. A and it forces you to really think it through. And sometimes I walk away from the tennis court thinking, oh, that was miserable. I learned, I, I used none of my knowledge. I learned nothing. I'm going to give it up and go play pickleball or something else. A and I, then I always go back the next day and, and I find I'm playing a little bit better and, and something, the pieces have come together. Uh, I have not yet had a light bulb moment that will propel me onto the professional tour, but you know, perhaps it could still happen. I am, I think, a little bit restless in my understanding of the world, and I am always trying to find a better solution for the problems in front of me. When Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine in the full scale invasion in February 2022, I felt very personally connected to this because I, I used to work in Ukraine and I, I know um, some prominent Ukrainian economists quite well. And my immediate reaction was, let's figure out how to use our knowledge to stop this invasion and, and to roll it back, which, which uh, you know, is a hard problem. And, and many people said, well, no, this is just a war and fight the war and then you do the economics later. And I've, I've, I've never... And perhaps that's right, perhaps I'm wrong, but I think that the figuring out how to use my knowledge and my expertise and my connections and my ability to process and pull people together and come up with solutions and then persuade people to move in a certain direction, I, 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 I want to use those skills. I feel um, I have a responsibility to use those skills in, in ways that are meaningful to me and, and to the people I care about.